Shashi Thoreau, you've written a book called Why I Am a Hindu. As a Congress politician, essentially a secular party, why does it matter whether you're a Hindu or not? Because, you know, it's actually suiting the other side to reduce the big battle that's going on, the sort of confrontation of ideas in India, to a clash between true Hindus and godless secularists, and to typecast those of us who disagree with their interpretation of Hinduism as godless secularists. I wanted to move the debate into one within Hinduism, saying that we disagree that the image you're projecting of our faith is the accurate or correct image of Hinduism. We also are Hindus, or there are Hindus in the Congress party who believe in the faith, but believe in a very different understanding of what the faith represents. So do you feel that Prime Minister Modi and his BJP have sort of stolen your Hinduism? Well, you know, it's, they've always pretended to have this ideology, which is called Hindutva, which I argue is not Hinduism. Hindutva is a political ideology. Hinduism is a set of religious, theological, spiritual beliefs. Um, but because of that, they have taken upon themselves the mantle of claiming to speak for all Hindus. And that's what I'm challenging. I mean, you, you write about a sort of a, a liberal, tolerant Hinduism, a Hinduism that doesn't say it's always right, that can believe in other gods, um, that, that isn't really sure what it is, and can be all sorts of different things to all sorts of different Hindus. That's not really the way Hinduism is being presented in India right now, though, is it? Not by and, the And it doesn't offer the certainty a lot of people want. No, but in fact, lack of certainty is precisely what Hinduism is all about. There's this wonderful example I give in the book from the, our oldest sacred book is the Rig Veda, 3,500 years old, which has in its early pages the creation hymn, the hymn to creation. And I quote the entire hymn, but the last verse says, where does all this creation come from? What makes, what has made the universe? Only he in the heaven knows, or maybe even he does not know. In other words, a religion that casts doubt even on the omniscience of the creator. This is the religion of incertitude. It is not a religion that preaches flat absolutes. Swami Vivekananda, the great preacher of Hinduism, who in Chicago at the World Parliament of Religions in 1893, really put Hinduism on the world theological map again. He said, I'm proud to speak for a religion that has taught the world not just tolerance, but acceptance. And his argument was that just as many rivers flow in different directions to the same sea, so also all ways of reaching out to God are equally valid. That's central to Hinduism. It's acceptance of difference. Uh, and if you don't accept difference, you are the one who is not a true Hindu. But isn't it a problem today to not really be able to answer what is a Hindu? No, but you see, a Hindu <laughs> is somebody who has a number of beliefs, and we've described that. For example, um, the Hindu says that you may look to the heavens to find God, but we as Hindus look within ourselves to find God. There are multiple ways of doing that search. There is the way of worship, bhakti, temples. You have 333 million manifestations of God to choose from because since nobody around has actually seen God or knows what God looks like or has touched God, therefore, we, given the limitations of our human imagination, need to visualize God in some more accessible form. So if you want to imagine God as a pot-bellied man with an elephant head, that's fine. You want to imagine God as an eight-armed woman riding a tiger, that's fine too. What do you and believe? by the same logic, if you want to imagine God as a bleeding man on a cross, that is also acceptable to the Hindus. So the point about Hinduism is this acceptance of multiple ways of seeking the same absolute. What, what do you believe in? This I believe your in the Hinduism that I have described in the book, which is one that believes that there is a soul. In fact, one difference between Hinduism and other faiths, in other faiths you believe that the body has a soul, whereas in Hinduism we believe that the soul has a body. We have a soul, it's occupying this body and that at the moment for whatever purposes it deems useful. And when it's done, it'll discard the body, but it will be itself permanent. And that soul will merge ultimately into the force, the divine force that suffuses the cosmos. That's a fairly basic belief. And if you don't agree with that belief, you're not inclined Doesn't to be matter. Hindu. <laughs> no, but you see, it's also true that the strength of Hinduism lies in the acknowledgement that every individual human being is different. It's a greater fate for the 21st century because if you want individual autonomy in today's world, 
Your religion doesn't give it to you. Religion says you have to believe certain specific things. But Hinduism says there's nothing you have to believe. You could believe this, you could choose not to believe it. The Hindu sacred books, and there, is, there are several, not just one, are like the sort of vast library in which no book ever goes out of print. And you can choose, as it were, to pick up from, read and annotate any one of these, this vast cornucopia of books to constitute your Hinduism. So this, in truth, is a big election leaflet, isn't it? Oh, come because on. the election is coming up next year and you've got to say, or maybe at the end of this year, and you've got to say, we speak for Hindus too. It's not just the well, BJP. You know, many of the concerns in this book go back to my earlier books as well. My great Indian novel, which is now 29 years old, uh, talks about dharma in great detail. Uh, my book, Riot, which traces the violence that preceded the destruction of the Babri Masjid in India in the late 80s, talks about Hindu-Muslim violence and the ideology of Hindutva. And my book, in the India from Midnight to the Millennium, 20 years ago, spoke about my own reflections as a believing Hindu in shame at what had been done with the destruction of the mosque five years earlier. So I've got a record of having thought about and expressed views on these concerns. This is not a book conceived of only for this election. No, sure, it's, but if... It's certainly, for me, ra a rather profound statement of what I believe and the Hinduism I've lived with, grown up and practiced. But you said you want to reappropriate your religion and yes, say it is not just what the, the RSF and the BJP says. The moral urgency comes from what the forces unleashed by the BJP have tried to portray Hinduism as being. I believe it's not what they're trying to portray. I don't believe Hinduism, the soaring majesty of the Upanishads, the Vedas, the metaphysics I've described in the book, can be reduced to something like the team identity of the British football hooligan. But that's what these people are doing. They're saying, my football team is better than yours and I'll bash you on the head if you don't agree. That kind of Hinduism is not Hinduism. There isn't the danger that if you go around saying, we are Hindus too, we speak for Hindus too, and we've seen your colleague Rahul Gandhi going off around the temples, um, do, doing his tours as well. Hindus in India who, who, who care about their religion within politics will say, we don't want the weak imitation, we want the strong brand of the other side. Ah, but it depends on how you interpret that you know, strength. If you I think pander it takes to a, a prejudice, strength. people will say, we, we'd like the real thing. No, but we're not pandering to prejudice. We're saying that our belief in Hinduism embraces others that our Hinduism is an inclusive Hinduism, that our Hinduism says that we... Are... In fact, I talked about Vivekanand's famous line about tolerance and acceptance. Tolerance is something we've all been brought up to believe is a virtue. We're taught in school that a tolerant king is a good king and tolerant system is good. But when you really think about it, tolerance is actually a very patronising idea. It says, I have the truth, you are in error, but I will magnanimously indulge you in the right to be wrong. Acceptance, on the other hand, is actually far more interesting. It says, I believe I have the truth. You believe you have the truth. I will respect your truth. Please respect my truth. To me, this is the profound message of Hinduism. And therefore, it takes robustness and strength to be able to say, as a Hindu, you worship Islam, you worship Christianity, we accept you as you are, you have an honoured place in our home, we will together build this home into something special for all of us, but just leave me to be myself and I will leave you to be yourself. That's the best recipe for a multi-religious democracy like India. But, but can you as a party still say, we are the party for all Indians and yes. all minorities, Absolutely. and you come from an area with, with, with strong Christian and Muslim. And, and Muslim communities as well, and say, I really speak for you all, until you've written the book about Christianity and uh, Islam and everything else as well. I mean, you're moving towards a, a place that the Congress has spent decades trying to stay away from. Well, I don't think at the moment we have much choice but to engage in the terms of this debate, because if we just, through our silence and inattention, let one party run away with the message that they are somehow the only defenders of Hindus and Hinduism, then we are ceding a political space that actually represents a very large portion of our population. Therefore, it makes sense for us to confront that argument. We can do so in many ways. For some years, we've confronted it on the basis of secularism, pure and simple. You know, keep religion out of politics. That hasn't worked well enough. These guys are in power. So it's better to say, 
practice your faith. We are as proud of our faith as you are, but what we are proud of is inclusiveness, liberalism, acceptance, and coexistence, rather than your version, which is divisive, which is exclusive, which is pushing people away from the narrative of oneness that can take India forward. Uh, so it's a robust vision, not a weak vision. It's not soft Hindutva, it's not Hindutva at all. It says Hindutva is not real Hinduism. What we believe in and practice is. What, what Prime Minister Modi is also doing, though, beyond religion, is embracing the concept of welfare in India, isn't he? I mean, that, that's mm. surely something that you would welcome. Yes, well, he sneered at us for the various policies that he has now reluctantly come around to realising are necessary in a country where the vast majority of the population still lives on less than $2 a day. So, <coughs> to that degree, uh, having told us that all our welfare schemes had to be jettisoned during his election campaign, he is now taking ownership of them. But that's In a good some thing. cases, renaming them. So we say, well, you're not a game-changing government, you're a name-changing government. Well, yes, I think we can give him credit for proving us right. But, but that, that means he is taking the country in a direction that, that will be popular electorally, isn't it? I mean, he's doing all the right things, is, is my point. You know, oh, he, no. is, he, is, he is expressing we've, we've a, the... a Hindu confidence for those people who like that, and he's also addressing the concerns of the poor. Not enough, because unfortunately we had the disastrous demonetization that cost lives, cost jobs, closed down industries, threw daily wage workers out of work. He has had the botched implementation of the goods and services tax, GST, in such a way that it's completely paralyzed small businesses, where even a, 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 a chap selling one single product has to fill in 37 forms a year in order to be able to keep up with the, the tax requirements of the, of the new regime. He has presided over a decline in the rate of economic growth at a time when the rest of the world economies are all improving their performance in previous years. India is the only one to have gone down in the last fiscal year. So I'm not quite sure what you can point to as doing the right thing, because economically, it's been a disastrous case of misgovernance and mismanagement for four years. I suppose Indians might like his, his strong relationship with the United States and President Trump. But it was very strong under the previous government, too. Manmohan Singh uh, was cited by Barack Obama as the first world leader he would name amongst the world leaders he had respect for. So there's nothing different there. India does have a valuable relationship with the other large democracy, uh, and that will continue. And there's also a very strong Indian-American presence uh, in, in the US, which is an important constituent of that relationship. So all of that exists, just as we have uh, co historic connections to Britain, we have new connections to America, which, which no government is going to be able to change. So I don't actually see anything very different to what Mr. Modi is doing that would suddenly stop being done if the, other, if the opposition came to power. The policies he's continued are our policies, and we're very happy to reclaim them. But the policies he's initiated have been disastrous, and that's what we'll hold him to account for. Um, in, in a, in a approaching, I was going to say post-Brexit, but we're still approaching Brexit uh, in, in this country um, uh, environment. Britain's after a trade deal with India, or will be. Is India interested? We would be, we could be, but the terms of trade are going to have to be very different from the Empire 2.0 that some people fatuously floated last summer. Because Empire 1.0, as far as we're concerned, was a pretty bad idea, and we don't want to see another version of it. But if you're offering genuine mutual give and take, if you will offer us things that you'd like us to take, but in turn give us things we'd like you to take, of course we can have a trade deal. Uh, the issue, however, is that it may not just necessarily be goods we want to sell you. For example, uh, we have huge issues with the, uh, the problems and challenges faced by Indian visa applicants, including students. Uh, we have problems for students getting temporary work permits. We're talking about a couple of years of work experience, so they can get some of that before they come back and contribute to our economy. We're talking about the fact that if a, uh, an Indian tourist applies for a UK visa, he pays the same amount as a Chinese tourist, but the Chinese gets a two-year visa and the Indian gets six months. We're talking about some of these very, very crucial issues on which there will have to be give from Britain, or I don't think there's going to be give from India on, on Scotch whiskey or, or, or whatever else it is that Britain would like to sell us. From where you see it, do you think Britain has a racist immigration policy? I would not want to apply a facile label like that, but I do think that England has developed in recent years a far more restrictive immigration policy towards Indian applicants than any self-respecting Indian government can welcome. Did you follow the Windrush scandal in this country? Briefly, I mean, I mean which it obviously got, also got some attention, it to, got some attention to, 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 some, to some Indian families as well. That's yeah. right, and in particular the West Indies uh, Caribbean uh, folks who, who came here 
many, many decades ago, but didn't get the documentation at that time and are now being made to suffer. I think it's very important that redress should be offered. I mean, there's, I've never forgotten that wonderful photograph that run, went around the world a few years ago of black and brown protesters holding up placards outside the Houses of Parliament saying, we are here because you were there. And I think Britain has to remember its colonial responsibility, uh, which is, in a sense, uh, what has made the immigration issues of today possible. Um, just on the trade question, I mean, have you, ha have you met Liam Fox, the Trade Secretary? I mean, do you know if he's had any talks with, with your side? Yeah? No, actually, um, my committee, I chair the Foreign Affairs Committee, we don't look after the trade portfolio. I think maybe I've met my counterpart here, Tom Tuganath, who, who chairs the, the Select Committee on Foreign Affairs in, in the British Parliament, but I've not met Mr Fox, no. While you've been writing this, and this is not the first book in the last few years, you've been going through um, the most astonishing period of being investigated and your private life being splashed all over the newspapers. You're on the front page of the newspapers today because you've been summoned by the court in Delhi to appear next month. Uh, will you go? Of course. Look, I've been cooperating fully with the four and a half years of investigation, and I've always maintained that we should have faith in our legal system, in our judicial process, and we should see, see through the process. So, of course, whatever the law requires, I'm very confident that there's no basis whatsoever for these charges, and I intend absolutely vigorously to contest them within the law. You called into question on Twitter the motivation of the Delhi police in pursuing you, first on the question of whether you murdered your wife and now whether you uh, were involved in, 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 uh, in pushing her towards suicide. I mean, what, what do you mean by that? What do you fear is motivating them? Look, I wish I could get into this debate, Krishna. The fact is that because the case is sub judice, as they say, um, I have been instructed by the lawyers that I can't go beyond the statement I've already issued, which I've just summarised for you a minute or two ago. I believe these charges are preposterous. I believe they're baseless. There isn't a shred of truth in either uh, the charge that there was any foul play or any crime was involved in the tragic and premature death of my wife. I want to see justice done, but at this point, I can't enter into the merits of it. It's a process that has to be gone through before judges and courts. And you deny absolutely the question of cruelty. I mean, cruelty is a difficult thing to define, and I, I imagine this is going to be a difficult thing in court. I, I, I can't because, I mean, there's never, nobody ever, neither anybody who's ever known me for 62 years, nor anybody who's a friend of Sunanda's, my late wife's, nor herself, has ever pointed to or accused me of a single act of cruelty. I'm just not that kind of person. I've, I've, I'm afraid I've, uh, I've got a, a sense of disbelief about some of these charges because um, those who know me know the kind of person I am. And, uh, and, and they are in a state of disbelief. It's no accident that, for example, her only brothers and her only son uh, have stood by me throughout this. They don't believe a word of what's being suggested. And I believe, ultimately, when there is no truth to an accusation, justice will prevail and those charges will fall. I mean, I last interviewed you about this in 2015. There you are. And it is still going on today, at the beginning of a court Doesn't that process. speak for something? I mean, that would have to happen just a few months before an election. I, that's what you think this is about. As I say, I can't say much more, but, it, uh, you know, when, when, one looks at certain things and uh, one comes to one's own conclusions, but uh, we'll see... How, what how do you keep are. working through, through this? I mean, you know, literally, your emails, your messages, your wife's emails, you know, splashed all over the newspapers routinely, leaks from the investigation, uh, details about the post-mortem, all of those sorts of things, and yet you can maintain this kind of output? I mean, is, how, how are you doing it? It helps to have a clear conscience, Christian. I do.